full disclosure, the voice you are listening to now is artificially generated, brought to you by Satisphonic.com. See the link in the description for more details. What TV trope was common in the not so distant past, but is completely unacceptable today? Misunderstandings that can now be cleared up by a text or cell phone call. Entire episodes used to be built around people not be able to find communicate with each other and just having to figure stuff out. Cell phones complicate so much fiction these days. I read a story from a horror writer and he said cell phones changed how they have to write because 99% of the stuck in a murder townhouse situations would be solved by phones now. Oh yeah, for sure. I write thrillers for a living and the idea of a MacGuffin that is hidden is a lot harder to pull off than the now dead character hiding it could have just called the right people and told them or sent them the data in an email etc. I have a very good editor, he's buff denominated, and had this exact one in my latest story outline with them finding a report he's hidden. But he could have just sent it to his daughter by email. As I'm older, I have to adjust my mindset constantly to deal with stuff like that. Do you ever just set the story in the 80s or something to get around that? Or does it feel like a cop out to you? you running through the airport to confess one's love for the protagonist. Home alone premises. These wouldn't happen today with current security measures. Not really TV trope, but slapping women that were supposedly having a panic attack was almost a trope in westerns and wire movies. Get a hold of yourself. People walking around with amnesia. Every freaking show, someone hit their head and had amnesia, and there was nothing anyone could do about it. Like, hello, brain injury? Usually the solution to problems brought about by a blow to the head is another blow to the head. Because debis are like on-off switches. Very special episodes. Where characters meet life-altering situations, drug addictions, teen pregnancy, gun violence, and then are back to being carefree the next episode. The most egregious example of this I've seen was on 21 Jump Street when Johnny Depp shoots a judge and kills him and the next episode it's like it never happened. A rookie cop kills a judge and no one cares. It's kinda the flaw with episodic TV. Some episodes can be really serious or have traumatic experiences, but there is no continuation. Some episodes are like this in Star Trek Tang, thinking in particular of when Troy got sexually assaulted. Never mentioned again. X Files kinda changed the game with its mix of episodic monster of the week's episodes and its canon ongoing storyline alien episodes. Edit thought of another. In ER, Anthony Edwards' character becomes inexplicably super racist, one episode, completely against his normal characterization as a caring and compassionate guy, then he apologized for it to his black colleagues at the end of the episode. All is forgiven, it's never mentioned again, and he goes back to his normal character the rest of the series. Star Trek in the episode where Barkley is legit using the holodeck to recreate and have sex with the female members of the crew lives in my head rent free. So, many question. Like they act like this has never happened before, in spite of this being the obvious first use case for this sort of thing. How does the man mayonnaise get cleaned out, or does it magically disappear? How is this not deeply inappropriate and not allowed? How could Troy ever look him in the eye again? When Riker and the other men just laugh about it at first, I am like bro what? At least in Deep Space Nine they addressed it more directly with Ferengi operated hollow brothel. How does the man mayonnaise get cleaned out, or does it magically disappear? Boimler is assigned to holodeck cleanup duty in Lower Decks, and it's quite clear that this is a unenviable gross job. Also the Enterprise. D is said to have self-cleaning capabilities multiple times. These episodes were funded by the government and produced basically free. The idea was to make a public service message that people would see in an example in the story. It's also why there were so many lines in TV shows like, Man, I really got to quit smoking. Looks like I picked the wrong day to quit sniffing blue. Not a 100% skewer, but to this day, I still chuckle about that Fresh Prince fourth wall break where Will Smith is like, if you want to know more about this or that, visit your local library. Nah, I just kidding. The fourth wall is more of a gauze curtain on that show. If we so rich, why we can't afford no ceiling? And the infamous Carlton Run. I love that the Carlton Run was just done as a joke, and Alfonso figured they'd throw it into a blooper reel episode, but they just flat up used it. Jazz, towards his later appearances, becomes increasingly unnerved by the sitcom-like changes. 
Viv being recast, baby Nikki suddenly being a five-year-old that nobody else seems to give much thought to. You have to remember that very special episode, Tem of Different Stokes, where Arnold spends a bunch of time with a child molester. Or when Michelle J. Fox gets addicted to speed for a report and paints the entire house, finishes the report and sleeps through the deadline. Or the Fresh Prince episode, you know the one. Hey, I didn't realize Fresh Prince had so many very special episodes. I was talking about the one where his dad shows up for part of an episode to take him to live with him, then bolts while he's in another room. I swear I wasn't trying to bait seven different answers. Nobody wants to mention Jessie Spano and her caffeine addition. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm so scared. Degrassi. Emma had an eating disorder and was back on her feet in like two episodes. Average recovery time for an eating disorder is eight years. I'm three years in and still have meltdowns at grocery stores. I have doubts that a clip show episode would do well these days. These used to be made to pad out your episodes without a big budget cost, but shows are increasingly getting written and budgeted at around how many episodes the story needs, and not how many episodes the story needs, and not how many they need to fill every time slot that season. The clip shows also worked because people didn't necessarily watch every episode of a show back then. A lot of shows took some time to find an audience, so when the clip show played, there was a good chance you were seeing some clips, you were seeing some clips you were unfamiliar with. In the age of streaming, that's not really the case anymore. If you start watching a show that's now in its fourth season, you're going to start from episode one on streaming. I tend to use The Simpsons as an example. Today, many early episodes are iconic, but back in the 90s, you either caught older episodes in reruns during the off-season, which could be highly variable, or you had them on vape. I remember in college one year, one of my housemates had recorded like eight tapes worth of episodes, and it was amazing to have. But there were a ton of missing episodes. It wasn't until the early 2000s, when I had a TiVo mostly dedicated to The Simpsons, that I happened to see some older episodes I had no recollection of. It took them until 2001 to start releasing DV sets, and that was about one season per year at first. And that's The Simpsons. I remember being so excited when my TiVo started recording the A-Team because you just couldn't find some shows, even if they were highly memorable. We sort of take for granted that iconic TV shows are entirely available now with just a click or two. I do kind of miss the feeling of catching a good episode you never saw before or catching one of your favorites. Kids from the streaming era just don't get the serendipity of TV. Shows were designed for it. Yup, and now that I can watch any episode of anything at any time, I never know what to put on. Do I try out the show my friend recommended me? Do I take a gamble on something interesting looking that I've never heard of? Or do I watch The Office for the 25th time? I really miss channel surfing as a concept, and a big part of that was the excitement of stumbling on, for example, a Mythbusters rerun of an old episode you never saw before. Clip shows also existed in a time when TV seasons were 20 episodes that released once per week. Clip shows and recaps were basically needed considering. There usually were no reruns until the season ended. Chances are, after 20 weeks, you forgot how the season started. Goodness help you if it was a part in a part two. Community took the format of a clip show and played with the concept. They got me. I thought I somehow missed a lot of episodes. Stalking a woman long enough and constantly will eventually make her fall for you. This was probably the most confusing thing growing up in the late 80s and early 90s. This odd thing was sold to both genders. The guy was supposed to keep on going after being told to be uninteresting. This led into guys thinking, no means ask again, and girls saying no to guys that they were interested in, but thought this is how the game was played in real life. Even in my early twenties, I saw girls in my party crew doing this, quite often harshly rejecting a drop-dead handsome guy, then being all pissy about it when the guy just fucked off as being told to and didn't instead start the Rome commating ritual. I wonder how many boys grew up to be creepy men because they were told over and over again by Hollywood that no means just keep trying. One example that comes to mind is Tom Berenger's character in Major League. You can yell at me all you want, but I've seen enough cartoons to know that popping the back of a raft makes it go faster. Spying on naked women or women, changing clothes as an innocent boy teen right of passage. It's always sunny, does a great episode called The Gang Hits the Slopes or something. 
They go to a ski resort and live out 80s tropes from their childhood before realizing how fucked up it all was. Everything from what you mentioned to skiing without helmet. I fucking love this episode because of how much it rips on those 80s ski movies. And how that guy who is trying to keep the spirit of the mountain alive is just some fucking burnout creep. And especially when they take it to its logical conclusion when they do the creepy shit. And they are all like, um, I don't see how that's a prank. It just sounds like a salt. So, honest question, because I haven't been skiing in 20 years. Does everyone wear helmets now? Last time I went, it was only the snowboarders. Yeah, pretty much. Old heads still out there without helmets on, but the de facto culture is helmets now, at least at East Coast Us Hills. Of Marty thinking his dad's a creep, and rightfully so. The panty raid as a wacky hijinks prank too. Don't mind me and the fellas breaking and entering, so we can't steal your undergarments. Boys will be boys edit. Please stop with the Spongebob anecdote. I remember some frat guys tried this at my college back in zero, or one or so. There was an article in the school paper, the frat was put on suspension, and a bunch of other consequences. I still remember one of the quotes from the women. Something along the lines of do, they even know how expensive women's underwear is. It really highlighted the straight up theft angle of it. Game show hosts kissing female contestants on the lips. Did anyone do this other than Richard Dawson? Edit. I've watched a fair amount of the prices right and match game over the years, and while there was cheek kissing, pocket fishing, and lewd remarks, I don't recall any kissing on the lips except on Family Feud, at least not routinely. Bob Barker used to make female contestants reach into the $100 pockets of his suit jacket if they guessed the price exactly right. If it was a guy, he would just hand him the $100 bill. Bob Barker would have women reach into his pocket for $100 bills but never the men who won that $100 bonus for getting the exact price. There's an episode where a man jokes about reaching for it and Bob acknowledges it's not appropriate, alludes to it being gay. I don't remember which episode. It's one of the reruns on Pluto TV. To this day, I have no idea how Revenge of the Nerds got the green light. Jokes about spousal abuse. It's a movie, but my wife and I recently sat down and watched the Philadelphia story, A Teps, N Wikipedia, or Gwikifaith the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Stool film. The fact that the protagonist used to beat his wife is played for laughs. Catherine Hepburn's character's little sister is constantly saying stuff like, I want to stay and see if he socks her one, as an unfortunate mistake that was a byproduct of alcoholism and something that Cary Grant's character has grown from. Also somewhat Catherine Hepburn's fault, as she drove into it, she apologizes towards the end. Good Lord, none of this would fly in the modern day. Or just straight up slapping women on screen. The amount of old movies and TV shows where a woman speaks up about something and gets backhanded is absolutely insane. If you see a woman get beat up in anything, now it's normally a storyline of domestic violence to highlight that it's wrong or to show a bad character, but in old movies it's the hero of the story slapping his girlfriend around like nothing. Suicide used to be a common joke, especially in cartoons. If you wanted to show a character was sad, they would pull out a gun and put it to their head. Duffy Duck did this all the time, and it was normal. Honestly, I feel like this kind of humor would play well with today's youth, although maybe it wouldn't fly with the censors these days. Thinking about Daffy Duck saying unalived makes me preemptively spin in my future grave. Yeah, but Daffy would pull the trigger, there would be a bang, his head would be covered in soot, and his beak would spin around his head a few times. Otherwise, he was fine. Or his harp-playing angel ghost would slither out of his body, ascend to heaven. Romancizing teachers, dating their students comedic town drunk. Think Otis from the Andy Griffith show. I think part of the problem is the comedic town drunk is something so many people can relate to because every small town seems to have one. My town growing up certainly did. His name was Silas. He drove a lawnmower everywhere because he lost his license and would shout ye. When it reached max speed, the man could consume an impossible quantity of alcohol and just as quickly piss it all out. He was homeless and on a first name basis with every police officer in the county. He could tell the funniest, dirtiest jokes and in late autumn would commit some minor harmless crime to spend the winter in jail where he'd put on a lot of weight instead of spending it in his tent. 
He was also a very reliable handyman. Our family hired him a few times to remove massive trees, and he dropped them right where he said he would. But that's where the comedy and trope end. I refer to him in past tense because he died of liver failure. He was ill with an addiction and desperately needed help to get past it, and that's what the TV tropes fail to discuss. Consequently, it's funny to the audience because it conveniently ignores the harsh reality of a situation. My grandfather was the town drunk, or one of them small town. Everyone loved him because he was such a hard worker, and my grandmother was an upstanding lady in the community. He even played Santa in the Christmas parade. My grandmother's church got its first air conditioner because she told the pastor staff that the bar had one, and if they put one in, her husband would come to church, and he did. He died before I was born of cirrhosis of the liver. Ah, yeah, the lovable and brainless alcoholic Barney from The Simpsons is another great example. Sex pests. There used to always be a sitcom character relentlessly hitting on women and talking about how horny they were. The most recent two I can think of were probably Fez and Early, series Howard Wolowitz. I don't think it's a completely erased type of joke, but you don't really see full on sex pests anymore. And rewatching some of these interactions is actually a little surprising. There was a good Big Bang episode. Yes, it happened, particularly in the first three seasons, in which he pulled his whole incel. Ish, Madame, I'm a Lotharia routine. On Penny, and she makes him feel like a little worm, which he is. I do sort of recall the other characters siding with Howard, though. He doesn't mean anything by it. You've hurt his feelings. To their credit, she doesn't back off. She doesn't back off. She doesn't back off. She does soften it a little and say something along the lines of, "Look, you idiot. No woman wants this." So they did sort of deal with Howard eventually. Mind if I smoke in places where people would instantly object today, like cars, airplanes, spaceships, the baby's nursery, etc. Fixing the Tom girl who likes to wear boys' clothes, no makeup, and do boy things. There's an Andy Griffith show episode that would be considered an over the top parody if it came out now. Edited, tied to Ultima for pointing out I meant tomboy. Quicksand, rattlesnakes, and grappling hooks. The worst is when you're stuck in quicksand, so you grab a vine to pull yourself out, but the vine is a snake. You're stuck in quicksand. You grab a vine. Yay! The vine's a snake. Boo! The snake offers you a grappling hook. I. People living in Nice and L.A. that never lock the front door. Not. Just to piggyback onto Ufatidin Molasses, but rape as character development for a female character. It was a very common trope with soap operas. Luke and Laura on General Hospital were moved into a relationship because he raped her on the floor of his nightclub. Cricket Blair, nice but vapid teen model on The Youngs the Restless, became Christine Blair, law student, when she was raped in her apartment. Marty Saybrook on One Life to Live was portrayed as a spoiled snotty, as a spoiled snotty, and heavens to Betsy. Promiscuous party girl who was upset the town's pastor wouldn't date her. After being gang raped on the show, her character became a psychiatrist. Brooke Logan Forrester from The Bold and the Beautiful was set up to be raped by a man hired by her own former mother-in-law in order to set up a truce between Brooke and her mother-in-law, and so on and so on for decades. The irony is not lost on me. The irony is not lost on me that soap operas were women's entertainment. Sexual assault as character development is rampant in literature, in my opinion, primarily in fantasy. Also, the show Outlander is a great example of this, based on books. Although I've heard there's actually way more rape in the show than the books. No, the show doesn't add any, and even left one out showing just the aftermath. But regardless, I the format of Outlander is a prime example because every main character is sexually assaulted at some point. The extra irony of this is that she's very notorious for kicking up a fuss about people writing fanfic about her books, and even once went as far as saying that people who write fanfics are essentially raping her characters by using them without permission in a now deleted live journal post. Like girl, you do basically every other chapter. Hell, Game of Thrones did it with Sansa Stark. There was also that terrible scene with the Hound where she says she's glad it happened because it made her a badder. In the end, their relationship was sweet, with the sun of my life, moon of my life stuff. But it's easy to forget that Daenerys was absolutely terrified of Drogo for a decent chunk of the time she knew him. 
I feel like the intent of the book was interesting, where Dany's character developed because she learned to make the best of a bad situation and take Drogo as a lover rather than owner, which importantly set up the rest of her story because her version of making the best of a bad situation continues to be fucked up and completely unhinged. I don't think you're ever meant to think that what happened between Dany, a 14-year-old girl, and Drogo was sweet and romantic, at least not without that grimace, worthy context. I got to say, I went back and watched some episodes of a team, and those scenes of Hannibal disguising himself as a Chinese laundromat operator made me choke on my drink. In Get Smart, there was a baddie named the Claw, but the joke is, he's Chinese so always pronounces his name as the Claw, Hot Bay Reeve, Beft Gags Reeve Ne Fight, See Dick Jitch Gwerkswaft, There's Jack Jack. There's an episode of I Love Lucy where slipping Lucy a roofie is a plot device. Overweight lazy husband with a smoking hot nagging wife. Add in one rebellious teen and one nerdy kid and boom. The family sitcom recipe. Love spells potions being a light-hearted bit of hijinks as opposed to attempted rape. I like how in Harry Potter they're occasionally presented as a bit of innocent teenage shenanigans. Oh, and are also a central part of the origin of Wizard Hitler. They could have headlined their ban with that Ruppy Men. It's crazy how common it was, in 70s sitcoms, for a girl to be saved from a rapey guy when her friend roommate dropped in early. And it was never a big deal. The guy was just scolded for not being a gentleman and then sent on his merry way because hey. If anyone has seen Three's Company, a 70s sitcom about a single guy living with two single girls, so he has to pretend he's gay or the landlord won't rent them an apartment. This dude was always getting home just in time, just in time to pry some guy off one of his unwilling roommate. Then they kicked the guy out, had some ice cream and joked about how the girl had terrible taste in men. Dude, I've seen that. While the actual attempted rape wasn't played for laughs, the aftermath was always supposed to be humorous. The roommates would joke about the attempted rape black boy Janet, you really can't pick them. Or Jack, the male roommate, would be like, well, your date may have tried to rape you, Janet, but you're not the only one who had a bad night. My date went back to her ex and stuck me with a bill for a lobster dinner. It was crazy. Like Chrissy's disgusting older boss, who would literally chase her around the desk at work, was played for laughs. He wasn't a predator, he was a naughty old man, and the situation was only resolved after they tricked his wife into showing up at the office and catching him in the act. The subreddit rascal people once had a question about workplace sexual harassment. The vast majority of the women who responded were young women in the 1960s and 70s. They said that the actual term sexual harassment didn't really exist then because it was so common. It was normalized and expected that if you were a woman, and especially young, that you'd have to fend off unwanted sexual advances from men, including your boss. It's really recently that those type of men and that behavior are being called up. I'm not quite that old, but I can tell you that this continued unabated into the late 90s, early 2000s. I was definitely harassed daily back then. Simply existing as a tall, blonde woman was enough to cause aggressive sexual harassment and worse. At the end of the first Back to the Future film, when Marty's dad is scolding Biff to go wash his car, they reminisce with a chuckle about how they have always had to keep an eye on that guy. Chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. Remember when he tried to rape your wife in the car in that parking lot that one time, and you punched him out? Yeah, he sure is a character. Chuckle, chuckle. The flamboyant gay character, where their sexuality is either intended for the audience to laugh and make fun of if becomes a joke with other characters. Or in the case of Friends, the straight character who everybody thinks is gay and is the butt, pun intended, of the joke. I enjoyed him, him but Jesus, Barney was something. Not too a serious one, but I don't watch much TV. But are they still making light of head injuries and its selective amnesia properties? I swear, Lex Luthor in Smallville should have a brain the consistency of watered-down pudding by the end of the series. 51 times, Lois Lane beat him at 52 times, despite not being on the show until season 4. Lois was knocked out, I believe something like 57 times, somebody counted. She shouldn't have been able to function after that many concussions until this. One of these days, one of these days, pow, right in the kisser, and bang, zoom, you're going to the moon, Alice. The honeymooners. It's a TV comedian. 
and he was just using space travel as a metaphor for beating his wife. Smoking. My favorite thing is when they show warnings before movies. Guy gets his brains blown out gang rape smoking. Schindler's List, The Holocaust, smoking. Smoking went through changes. Everyone smoked, only the bad guys smoked, and now no one smoked. I remember being surprised at how much cigarette smoking featured in Better Call Saul until I realized that the show is set like 20 years ago. And then I was like, yep, totally accurate. The gay man, you knew he was gay because he was wearing a neckerchief and cracking the only jokes worth a damn. I remember being surprised at how much cigarette smoking featured in Better Call Saul until I realized that the show is set like 20 years ago and then I was like, yep, totally accurate. Men being complete morons that can't even iron a shirt without ruining it. The absolute horror of a male character seeing another male character in any form of undress. A best friend who I have known for decades and grown up with and discussed sexy sex stuff with. I think I have a nasty rash on my bottom. Could you have a look? Oh God, no. No. What am I, a gay? What will the non-existent women think if they ever found out I saw your butt cheek? For the love of everything, put it away. Here, I will help you up. Step in my hand as I hoist you. No, because my fully clothed dick will be near your face. The insult stalker, nerd allow curl and screech. The contentious wife husband, trope like Arl and Peg Bundy. No, I think about the dynamic in that show from time to time. I think it was a genuine counterpoint to not just the happy husband, but also the horny one. Like, here's his bombshell wife who's always ready to go, and the husband is all, A, I'm too tired. I think that was pretty subversive for the time. It strikes me as one of those things that makes sense as a cleverly subversive writing move in its own era, but that makes less and less sense as time goes on, leaving only the top level red of their dynamic as toxic. Yeah, I watched this show recently after not seeing it since I was a kid and realized how much of the humor relied on it being the complete opposite of the normal sitcom family parody. There's certainly a super low-brow aspect to it, but on a higher level it's making fun of itself and parodying the genre in general. In a way, it's quite brilliant. Who would ever thought that a sketch comedy show would do psychological horror so well? Key Peel was seriously great. Oh, it very much is. It was written to be basically the opposite of every 50s trope. The husband is too tired to sleep with his wife, so he's turning down her advances. His kids are screw-ups, but generally pretty happy. His wife is happy, and he works in a woman's shoe store of all places. Satire just doesn't age well because people forget the tropes that are being satirized. Leggy blondes on game shows, and all roasting plus-sized women in the shoe store.